And now, please welcome back to the stage, Simon Jones. Welcome back, everybody. How are we feeling? All right? Good, good. Well, it's day two of Unreal Academy London, and you guys seem to have survived day one pretty well. So what I'd like to do at this time is bring some stories to you from elsewhere, and we've picked some stories today that we think really do set the scene for what's going to come in the presentations today. I want to mention this one. Uh, this is an award-winning architectural and infrastructure of visualization studio out of Auckland. Um, and they, uh, they're called Build Media, and they work with an Australian real estate company called Buildwise to create an innovative real-time experience for residential house sales. And their project's taken away from the customer this uncertainty in making decisions for new build homes. And it allows them to visualize the choices on offer in a way that they can react and respond and make informed decisions based on their experiences. The project's been so successful that Build Media recently announced that they no longer use a physical presentation suite to sell their uh, properties. There's a better experience for customers and it saves lots of money as well. So it's a real, real move forward, I think, in that sector. The management and maintenance of aircraft are really complex processes, especially at busy airports. And Finland's flag carrier, Finnair, they built a reputation over the years for being um, early adopters of new innovation. And they recently partnered with Unreal Engine developer Zoan to, crea to create and pilot a system that simulates AI and visualization data to enable seamless operations. And of course, they harness the power of Unreal Engine. Zoan were able to build a series of interactive VR and AR experiences based around digital replicas of both Helsinki Airport and, of course, the Finnair aircraft. And using physical and real-time data to analyze and improve processes. And this, this usage of real-world data to inform design is a theme of our presentation coming later from Shop Architects. They've got a great story about that. Now, as many of you guys know, creating really visually rich real-time projects is a challenge to keep performance high. And there's no environment that's more demanding than this than live TV when the nation is watching. And so BBC flagship sports program, Match of the Day, they switched to an entirely virtual set in Unreal for the new football season. And make sure you're here tomorrow morning because BBC Sports' John Murphy is going to dig into this, this project for his keynote talk, talk about their unique challenges they have in broadcast. And finally, you might remember last year, we had the amazing Ross Cranberger from Mini joined us on stage, for those of you here, to talk about his experimental project using Unreal to map and redesign the production processes for the Mini plant in Oxford. And via a series of promotions, uh, Ross recently moved to BMW's lead plant in Regensburg in Germany into a brand new job that was created just for him, where we'll roll out this technology globally to all BMW plants, including the new ones in China which is absolutely phenomenal. And we know Ross is awesome, but I want to make a special mention to BMW, because they provided this environment for Ross to spin up this crazy madcap idea and, and eventually deploy it globally. And businesses empowering their employees to innovate is a real recipe for success that Epic gets really behind. Now, empowering employees to, to take a leading role like that is fantastic, but surely you can't do that in the film and TV industry. Can you really let an employee direct their own film? Well, let's see. And now, please welcome to the stage, Tom Box. Hi, everyone. Uh, cheers for coming to see this so early on uh, today's session. Um, so my name is Tom Box. I'm co-founder of Blue Zoo. We're an animation studio based here in London. And today, I really wanted to, uh, to discuss some of the things of how real time has been uh, helping us in our studio, but in the more unobvious ways, from more of a cultural and from a business sense. So uh, to do that, I thought I'd give you more a bit more background to our studio by starting off playing some of our latest work. So here's a short montage reel of some of the more recent work we've done.
Thank you. So that gives you a taste of some of the work we can do. And as you, as you see, it's, it's, we do very kind of characterful CG animation. Um, a lot of the work we do is for long-form kids' TV shows. We do a lot of work with BBC and Nickelodeon and Disney and clients like that. Um, we're currently doing the new uh, Paddington TV series, which is great fun. But to give you a bit of a background context, uh, what makes our studio different is that uh, the way we started, uh, which was back 19, nearly 20 years ago. It was myself and a few classmates started, uh, thought it'd be nice to start a company whilst we're still at university. And over the uh, preceding 19 years, we've grown to become what we're now one of the biggest animation studios in the UK. I think we've got about 250 staff at the moment, all in London. And I think one of the reasons for that uh, success is because we've always experimented. And from day one, we've because we kind of evolved as an island, having never worked in any other animation studios before, we, um, we kind of figured out things on our own. And if someone said to us, this is the way things are done, uh, it's just, just the way it is, we kind of pushed in the other direction and never accepted the status quo or, or never really just went the, the expected route. And to this day, that's, that's how we continue to operate, so which has kind of led me to be on the stage today. So, but what's this have to do with real time? The, you know, everyone here knows all the immediate benefits of real time, how it can produce kind of incredible, mind-blowing quality of, uh, of imagery in crazy speeds, you know, making images at 100 frames uh, per second that kind of 10 years ago would have taken a few hours to render, and the exponential rate that's increasing and the business benefits that has for a studio from not having to have great big data centers on 24 hours a day, along with the kind of the carbon footprint that that, that produces. So it has those benefits of kind of really can, uh, reducing everything down to much more efficient uh, and fast systems. But I didn't really want to talk about that side of it today. Uh, for us and uh, for our studio, we, we see ourselves very much as a, a people first studio, and that's not some kind of corporate clickbaity thing to say. That's honestly what our, our ethos if, is. If we can have a studio full of happy artists working on projects they really want to work on, making work they're proud of, then that will mean our clients get work they're, they're over the moon with, which will attract more clients and more great artists who want to come work in our studio. So it's not rocket science, but it's a, it's a model that works really well. And it always surprises me that no, more businesses have that kind of attitude. To, um, to their staff. So, but that's kind of led us on to looking at the workflows we have, and we want to make sure the studio has uh, a great culture and great tools so artists can just get on with their work and do the best job they can. And using real time has really uh, opened our eyes into the, what's really crazy is the fact that the animation tools haven't moved on for, for decades since they're invented. And we have a very um, linear workflow compared to other industries, where you see how much things like Google Docs and Office 360 is all about collaborative workflows, the animation pipeline still seems to be stuck in the kind of the Office 95 kind of version where everyone's working in a very linear process, where the layout team hands it over to the animation team, the animation team hands it on to the lighting team, it goes off to a render farm, and then it goes to the compositing team. And if there's a problem, it then goes all the way back to the start of it, which is uh, kind of illustrated by Charlie Chaplin here. And it makes a torturous process sometimes, and that's not fun for everyone. It, it, ends, it ends in kind of having these horrible crunch times, and it's restrictive in so many ways. And, and we really think that real time is the, the gateway to break out of this kind of workflow. And we can do that through many ways. Um, when we introduced it at Blue Zoo, uh, our team went to, down to Epic's uh, Academy in Guildford and did a few days of training, and it was incredible to see how quickly people worked out, uh, worked out how to, how to uh, migrate to the tool. I'm sure if anyone here has done any workshops and anyone here who's, who's learned uh, Unreal has, uh, has seen how quick it is to pick it up, where we saw our artists within a few days uh, producing amazing imagery that would have taken a lot, a lot longer to learn in more traditional uh, non-real-time tools. And that's because you can get feedback very quickly which means you can iterate very quickly. And I think even though the, the render engine at the end of a project uh, is very important, 
what really sets the benchmark of quality for any animation production is the look dev stage. And that is all down to how many times you can iterate through a design to get to what the director wants, what the client wants, and what the artists have in their head. And the quicker you can iterate at that stage, it sets the benchmark for the entire production. So uh, if your look dev uh, stage isn't, is, is limited by technology, that has huge ramifications for the rest of the, the production. Equally with the collaboration stage, it's very exciting now seeing all these, um, these tools that allow uh, kind of group uh, workflows and, um, and collaborative systems that, that allow everyone to really work together. For example, on when we made uh, films in Blue Zoo using Unreal, we used Perforce, which has meant that multiple people can have the same scene open at the same time, the same level. So one person's working on, say, a shader. It's got a little icon next to it, to, so everyone else knows not to mess with that shader. So one person can be fiddling with the shader whilst another person's doing some lighting, whilst another person's kind of changing the camera angle. And that allows you to break out of that linear workflow, which causes headaches for everyone. So I really very much think that's the kind of the future. And equally, with, uh, with reviews, that allows uh, clients to, to make changes. And that can be great for not just the client, but it can be great for the studios as well, because it, it makes a, a better relationship for everyone. And that really made me kind of think in terms of the way we've been working so far in animation workflows. It's very much like working on a film set where everyone's got these blindfolds on and working in these kind of blinkered silos. And then every few days you have a, uh, a review session where everyone gets together and looks at their work kind of combined, then realizes everyone's kind of slightly uh, misunderstood sometimes what other people were doing. And then you see, OK, that's not right. You need to change that. You need to change that. And then everyone goes away for a few days and fixes it. And it's a very slow process. And it's not a real time process where switching to a real-time system with a collaborative workflow is kind of like taking those blindfolds off and allowing everyone to have complete contextual clarity as to what, uh, what everyone's colleagues are doing. And I very much think that is the future of where we're going. So it's really exciting to work with tools like Unreal that really uh, step in the right direction on that side of things. And that ultimately makes a better business, because if we're allowing our artists to, to really to, uh, to stop inhibiting their creativity and allowing them to do what they want in that speed, then that's great for everyone, along with the, the, the obvious business benefits that using real-time tools uh, introduces. So it's a no-brainer. It's a win-win for everyone, for the clients, for the artist, and for the business. But the tricky thing is, how do you introduce that in a studio, which is, is kind of like jam-packed full of work, where everyone's kind of uh, syncing with deadlines. Uh, and the way we've done that is at Blue Zoo is through a shorts program, because it's very hard to introduce these tools uh, onto a commercial project, because it's a bit like joining a motorway as a learner driver when everyone's going at full speed. And if you try and introduce a tool you're not familiar with on a commercial production, it can end up with a, uh, a bit of a pileup, of a, a motorway pileup, and then that's not great for reputation. So, the way we've done that at Blue Zoo is to, to mitigate that risk is in our short films program, where we set a few briefs. I think in the last five years, we've made about nine films. And we send a brief out to everyone in the studio, so we kind of give opportunity, allow anyone to pitch in a, pitch in a brief, and then everyone kind of votes on the winner. And with this, we really try and do something different each time and break free of what's kind of uh, expected to keep pushing our studio forward. So we thought this would be a great way to introduce uh, real-time rendering into our studio. So uh, I think about a year and a half ago, we sent a brief out to everyone uh, to, to make a short film. We wanted to base it on a human uh, real story. Um, so it's more focusing on the storytelling rather than story ideation. And the one creative limitation we said with that is that we didn't want the end finished animation to feel like it had been made in a video game engine because we were concerned that the, um, the obvious thing to do is to make something that essentially feels like a AAA game trailer. And that didn't excite us, because we know Unreal could do that amazingly well. And we want to kind of push the boundaries and push ourselves out of our creative comfort zone. So the brief kind of uh, set that tone. Uh, so uh, in the end, uh, one of our uh, very talented animation directors, uh, Dane Wynn, won the pitch and spent uh, a year and a half working with a small team 
to make this film Ada, which uh, had a very kind of like pencil shaded look uh, to break away from the expected looks you get from uh, engines like Unreal. The full, full film is currently doing the film festival circuit, and it is about 11 minutes long, so I'm not playing the full thing today, but here's a little snippet. I, one of my favorite moments from the process of making that film is when we finished it and sent it over to across the team at Epic, got an email back saying, are you sure this is done in Unreal? Which to me really says that the team absolutely smashed the brief. And one of the ways uh, that was done from the very uh, outset, there was a very conscious decision making of kind of embracing what I call the real-time ethos, which is trying to get away from any kind of caching points along the process Whereas most uh, real-time, when you see kind of amazing real-time visuals done, all that lighting information has been baked. So essentially, if you want to make a lighting tweak, it has to recalculate all the global illumination, et cetera, and then you have to wait 20 minutes for the new lighting setup to work. And that's kind of breaking out. You're going back to that linear animation workflow, having to wait for progress timers and all of that. So in Ada, we wanted to make sure that it was 100% uh, real-time. So this, in fact, you can watch the, the whole animation kind of playing real time and change anything. For example, on this shot, uh, it's from the opening shot, I think, what we can do with that one, we can just grab the camera and change it at any point. So all the process is done in post-process. We're not rendering out and then taking it into Nuke to do uh, any of the post effects. We're using all the tools within Unreal to do 100% of it. And that essentially is um, liberating from a storytelling standpoint because you can't always tell uh, if a story is going to work from the storyboard, but in a traditional animation pipeline, you're pretty much locked to the storyboard because the further you progress down the animation pipeline, the more expensive it gets to change the story. So switching to this workflow allows the director and the client to, to still play about with it at any point to really um, free the shackles of that kind of standard workflow. To, uh, as an example of that, when we made the short trailer and took it to a festival a year ago, uh, Dane, the director, uh, wasn't happy with the way Ada's uh, dress was looking. So literally 12 hours before delivery of a 90-second trailer with about 40 shots in, he decided to change all of the, the textures. And that would have been unfeasible in a standard traditional CG pipeline. But he, he, he changed the textures and clicked a button, and then the, the pipeline kind of rendered out all the different shots. And then 10 minutes later, we had a new version of the entire sequence with the shaders uh, all updated. And if that didn't work, using Perforce, we could have switched back to the old one and rendered out a different version. But the key thing is that uh, that freedom of experimentation uh, wasn't what you weren't worried about that of, of thinking, oh my god, if we render that out, not sure if we can get through the render farm in time, not sure then if the compers are going to have to stay in until 2 in the morning to render out these new shots, and then the editor's going to have to come in super early. There was none of that. You just click a button, and it was done. And for me, that's the key of storytelling, because the art form of filmmaking is all about experimentation. And for us, this has really allowed that experimentation to, to, um, to take place without without risk or causing that horrible kind of crunch time that all studios suffer from. So at Blue Zoo, we're very much uh, seeing how we can use this on our longer form production at the moment. We've, to date, we've done a few commercial projects with it, but we really see it very much as the future because it does allow our artists to do what we want our artists to do, which is just great, uh, make great content everyone can be proud of. And the one limiting factor today has been the amount we can kind of cram onto the graphics cards in terms of all the, the data. So we see the only limiting factor at the moment is that hardware. And the hardware is evolving at such a crazy pace. We very much think that in a few years' time, all animation will be done in final picture 
and you'll never have to wait for anything. So it's not if it's going to happen, it's when it's going to happen. And that's why we're really putting a lot into real-time rendering at the moment. So the next 20 years of Blue Zoo can be even more exciting and adventurous than the last 20 years. So uh, it's been great playing with it so far, and we look forward to do lots more. So thank you. And now, welcome Emma Fowler and Sam Anderson. Hello, everyone. Thank you to Unreal for having us today. We are both very excited to be here. I am Sam Anderson, and I am on the interactive visualization team at Shop Architects. And my main focus is bridging the gap between renderings and evolving technologies. And I'm Emma Fowler, a senior associate at CHOP, and I focus on creative development and the realization of spaces. But until recently, it was typically more the built environment and a little less of the virtual reality, but mm -hmm. a lot of that's changing. We are super excited to be here, and the last 24 hours, we've been talking with some of you whether at drinks last night or during the presentations yesterday. And it's amazing how much work is being done across so many different industries. And the amount of beauty that we're creating is really impressive on all fronts. Yeah, and I think although we all come from very different backgrounds, we are all still very similar, that we are designers, we're curators, we are creating these great experiences for our clients and the end user. And we've been so happy to use Unreal with our last few projects. But before we go into that, I'm going to let Emma describe a little bit about our background at Shop. Thanks, Sam. As you saw from the reel and some of the imagery up here, Shop is known for some of the most notable buildings right now in the New York City skyline. And while NYC is our home with over 30 million square feet of new development, or I guess here that's roughly 2.8 million square meters of new development in the UK, we have been expanding our network globally and are really excited about that. We've been recognized by Fast Company as the number one architecture firm in the world, but are even more proud to be considered number 33, most innovative firm for our non-traditional approach to architecture and business. And we've had a lot of great clients along the way that have helped us to get here. But our world is constantly evolving, and similar to you, I'm sure you're seeing how your own industries are being impacted by advances in technology. How amazing programs like Unreal are reshaping your daily business and the way you create journeys for your clients. And at Shop, that is something we've always been embracing. Shop has a long history of exploiting new tools specific to the tech sector to enhance the design process for designers, clients, partners, all in the service of creating a better environment for people. To share some project-based examples with you, during the design process of the Barclays Arena in Brooklyn, the cost of steel changed three times. Our use of parametric models allowed us, with few modifications, to quickly adapt models and populate thousands, and in this case, it was 12,000 plus, individual unique panels for direct-to-fabrication output, all in a matter of seconds. We also developed a barcode sy system and digital dashboard app that allowed us to track the panels as they were in the factory and brought to site. Our app allowed us to track panels that were on the facade, going up on the facade, or may have had a few defects that we needed, ten needed attention. This allows everyone from the person tightening the bolts to our client to see where the project is in real time, to make sure the project delivers on time, and complete transparency, which is not often the case in construction. In Botswana Innovation Hub in Africa, we used 3D scans of the superstructure and overlaid that with our digital models. And by doing so, we were able to flag irregularities and clash detection before installation, saving money and avoiding project setbacks. To Uber's new headquarters in San Francisco, we used geothermal mapping 
to trace heat gain on the facade system to help program operable windows that then synchronize back to the building's mechanical systems. This allowed user exposure to biophilia and building energy savings. But while we're thinking about how new technology can help us on a project base examples, we're also thinking about how it can impact our industry as a whole. We're thinking about things like zoning analysis. Originally, a developer would have to hire an architect. We would come in, we'd have to manually input in data to cross-reference building codes, site information to see what could be built on a site. Now, with just a click of a button, a developer can use their app and open it up, put the site in for Manhattan or one of the five boroughs, and the app will depict how tall a building can be, potential building masses, and its allowable use. Two exciting new endeavors focusing on off-site building fabrication, improving the environment by reducing construction waste, as well as decreasing construction time by 15 to 20 percent, which is huge in our industry. And when you start to think about all these project and industry-based examples, you start to realize there are certain trends that are happening. Yeah, this all starts to improve communication, it improves efficiency, it improves building accuracy, all while streamlining the design process, which is just so critical for us. Exactly. All of which are common trends that we're seeing right now in a project that's currently under construction, where we've used Unreal. Everyone here knows Unreal has amazing capabilities for VR and gaming. But what we want to talk to you about today is one example that is happening in real time right now and how Unreal has completely changed our visual communication with our clients, our partners, and our design teams. Mm -hmm. But before we dive into all the benefits Unreal has given us, let us give you a little bit of background about the project. Company, a new vertical tech headquarters and co-working space in the heart of Manhattan. This building is also home to a recognized tech incubator and startup companies. Our challenge was that this building was located in the heart of Manhattan. The client was super innovative, though, and he had a vision. He said, what if we take all the graduating tech companies from the incubator space and relocate them into the building? Not only would we create a tight-knit community of like-minded individuals, but he wanted to push the business model even further to include the tech residency program, where, by application and selection process only, that provided no rent and no equity for attendants that were approved, which is absolutely unheard of to get free rent in New York City. So I'm sure everyone here has had a similar challenge. You have an awesome client, you have an innovative business model, you have a willing and able team. How do you deliver something truly authentic for your client? Well, our problem on an architectural front was that the building looked like this. You mean like a big building from the 80s? It's Ye a little cringeworthy. Yes, exactly. And, and honestly, it's the exact opposite of what young tech firms are looking for today. Plus, we had the added challenge that the building was located in the very corporate heart of Manhattan, lacking all the downtown buzz and neighborhood vibes of other tech communities like Dumbo in Brooklyn or Chelsea in Manhattan. So because our neighborhood was not as programmatically dynamic, we needed to take the programs lacking in the area and bring them into the building and vertically displacing them throughout the section of the building, creating a concept of a city within a building aim to spark an ecosystem where venture capitalists and startup firms can connect and serendipitous interactions could occur. But in order to create environments like this, and many environments, we needed to layer in all the programming in a way that could spark the community. We needed to create places for people to lounge, places for people to eat, places for people to learn, to focus, to collaborate and work, places for review, and of course, places to get a cocktail, because we all need that. <laughs> and while these 3D renderings are beautiful imagery, they're only a glimpse of a selected view. They're stagnant. It's not exactly something tangible. It's not something like you can feel that you can reach out and touch, or even interpret for yourself. There's no personal connection or journey. 
But lucky for us, we had a young client who's also a gamer, and he wanted more. And he was requesting us to go out and find more in the industry. So fast forward to today, I'll give you one guess how we were able to convey all the visual content in a way we had never, ever done before. And at this point, I'll let Sam take you through our process and some of the happy things that happened along the way. Thank you, Emma. We are so excited to be using such a robust tool. Like Emma said, in the past, we made renderings, we made VR walkthroughs, we made animations, but all using different programs and different plugins, all with completely different graphic standards. So with the advancements of Unreal over the past few years, we can now use this one program to create all these different outputs, all while keeping the high visual standard. And with this project in particular, we have a great forward-thinking client, a very interesting project, and it's centered all around evolving technologies, so this is the perfect time to utilize Unreal for all of its robustness. But what we didn't know going into it was how much our design process would evolve due to the way that we were engaging with mediums in a little bit of a different way. And that's what we're here to talk to you about, our journey along throughout this process, and the little surprises we got along the way. First, we realized just how much it would change our design process. In the past, we would have to orbit around our model, around one person's screen with everyone else behind. Maybe you guys have been there. It's not a fun situation. Or showing a series of screenshots in order to convey our design intent to our partners. But now with the VR capabilities, we can have our partners inside the headset, walking around, seeing the review for themselves. And it's really amazing to watch this happen and have your designs come to life in this way. And it's in these critical moments that design decisions are made, such as how does the material wrap around the column? Or how am I going to get to the retail space from the lobby? These are things that may have been figured out down the construction line. But we can figure out them, figure these things out earlier and put them right back into the drawing set. But it also helped with the communication for our client. Our client was extremely receptive to having the VR headset on and making decisions while in VR. It became an incredibly resourceful tool for him to refer back to. I think one of our favorite stories was when he asked for a copy of the build. Mm -hmm. We were a little bit confused at first and tried to explain you had to have a certain computer with certain specs in order to hook the headset up to the computer. But he kindly informed us that he already has a computer. Actually, he told us, oh, my computer is way better than yours. He, he did say that. He definitely said that. But this is actually a photo we received from him when we were wanting to talk about tiling options. And I think images like this that we received along the way are so exciting to get. We've never been able to discuss design like this with a client before. And then now we have a client who's hanging out in our future building in his free time. But not only did it help with the client side of things, it also helped showing our stuff to the community. Imagine a future tenant coming into the space, no architectural background, doesn't know how to read plans or sections, but is able to put on a headset and imagine what his morning having coffee in his office might feel like, or looking up at the atrium, or having lunch on the terrace. And not only does it help with us showing our project off to the community, but to anyone who might be engaging in the space, such as contractors or stylists, or anyone we want to show our design intent to. And lastly, we realized the efficiency it afforded us. We created a blend of workflows and wrote scripts so that even though we are a small team, it was two of us at the time, we can still produce visuals that we are proud of. Now, that's not to say there were no bumps along the way. There definitely were. In hindsight, we would have used optimal textures from the very beginning, so we could take advantage of mid mapping. But or low poly models from day one. Yeah, low poly models for any of the architecture rendering to real time. That was like a huge thing for us. But with the blueprints, we could actually speed up the process in other ways so that even though it was just two of us, we could create an entire VR experience and have control over the story, over the props that are on the table, 
or which spaces we want the user to inhabit. But we didn't want to stop here. We wanted to take the outputs from our Unreal model and see in what other ways we could use it. Perhaps take a 360 panorama and project it onto a 360 room so that someone could be in this space at a one-to-one -one scale without having the headset on so that our design can be approachable to everyone. Or how about you throw a whole team in that space? But that experimental stuff was fun, but we wanted to see what else can we do with this rendering engine? How can we go above be or beyond animations? We would love to do photorealistic stuff, but I think we are actually more interested in how this can play a role in construction. Mm -hmm. So we created a spectrum of VR tools. Here we have an assembly tool. This allows designers to fully showcase how they imagine building components coming together. They can get into the headset and show contractors how exactly pieces are going to match together or what the materials will look like. We also have a VR scope box tool. This allows designers who have been working in 2D drawing details for their facade to be in a one-to-one -one scale with this section and fully understand the, all the components as well as have the real material representation. And then a disassembly tool. This could be used for projects that are already built to go beyond the construction photos. It's another way of visually representing something for our clients to show them what lies behind the facades. And lastly, a lighting analysis tool. This allows designers to toggle in between false color and real material representation so that they may have a more informed decision when picking out the best lighting scheme for this space. We built all of these tools in-house with the intention of giving all of our designers a wide range of mediums and tools so that they may curate a story for every single project. So that we may understand who our audience is and what is the best visual representation for that audience. We're hopeful that the people who go to the space once it's physically built will have an enhanced experience due to the way that we thought about visuals in a little bit more of an innovative way from day one. Agreed, Sam. And I think, too, as VR continues to evolve, technology evolves, for new generations, this will just be more instinctual. A child just picks up a headset now and can put it on and knows how to use it. It's, it's implementing these workflows will just naturally happen in our future. Absolutely. And as we said, we're all designers here. We're all here to learn from each other. So let's do it. Let's talk to each other, learn new things, and really push the boundaries of Unreal so much further. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome stuff. Well, thanks to Sam and, and Emma for bringing us that inspiring, inspiring story about new ways to engage with, uh, with customers. And also to Tom as well for his amazing uh, presentation earlier. I asked him just again this morning. That, that's definitely unreal, right? And he says, yes. <laughs> okay. All right, that's all from me. I just want to say um, thanks again. Glad you were all here and survived yesterday and survived the party. We need to have a fantastic day. And thank you very much. Okay.